dead leg. The biggest news since we last recorded is that NCAA President Mark Emmert has announced that he's going to uh, step down no later than June 2023, but sooner if his replacement can be found before then. Needless to say, uh, nobody was upset about this news. Mark Emmert um, has been a less than great NCAA president. I think most agree. Two-part question for you. Um, one, could could anybody be good at this job? And two, is there any reason for anybody to want this job outside of the salary is really, really good? Could anybody be good at the job? Uh, great to be back with you, buddy. Uh, by the way, just a heads up in case this uh, winds up being a thing. So wife is out of town, has been for a few days here. And I am solo dad duty. Uh, older son is at school. Younger one doesn't have pre-K on Thursdays. He might just float in and out of the screen here. This this is how we got to do it. So you're, also, you're, you're, you have a also in the process of potty training. And so um, I'm really hoping that in the next 30 to 40 to 50 minutes, he doesn't say, Daddy, I have to go poop. OK, so yeah. it's just I'm just letting everyone know. I hope that we're going to be clear, but I just want to give you a, a heads up on that. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hey, YouTube. you would have hey, seen me YouTube. talking on camera, but Mike, uh, but muting my mic there because I literally was telling my three year old to not make too much noise. As for your question here, uh, can anyone be good at the job? Yes, but we need to start with the idea that the job needs an accurate description and it doesn't have that right now. Mark Emmert was not a good NCAA president. Uh, he could be there for another three months to another 14 months. Uh, I'd probably lean toward the latter because as the NCAA right now is trying to redefine what the NCAA will even mean. There's this transformation committee that's been formed. I won't get too deep in the weeds on this, but it is an important factor. Right now, uh, there's a 21-person panel committee that's led up by arguably the most powerful person in the NCAA, Greg Sankey, SEC commissioner, in addition to Ohio's athletic director, Julie Cromer, that's very specific and intentional. You wanted one representative from the biggest conference in the, in the country, the most powerful conference, the biggest money maker, and then also someone who is in a position of power, albeit in that uh, group of five, if you will. Ohio obviously represents the MAC, and then there are many other people that are on it, but Sankey and Cromer are leading up that effort to redefine what Division I will actually mean, what the NCAA will mean as an entity for a generation to come. You, Until we actually get that, you can't hire a new president to replace Mark Emmert. There are questions out there that are even, should the NCAA have a president going forward? To be clear, I think it should, and it definitely will. But given how badly Emmert bungled the position over the past decade plus, it has led to a real, you know, critical juncture here for the organization overall. I mean, the fact that Emmert couldn't even sit at a press conference without one or two people uh, flanking him at the Final Four annually, because frankly, um, he just <laughs> he couldn't be trusted to uh, to always handle questions uh, and those, you know, those those sessions, if you will. I mean, he called him the Kansas City Jayhawks. Called him the Kansas City Jayhawks when Kansas won the national title, GP. So, uh, yeah, it's a really good paycheck. Um, who it's going to be, we can get into that in a second, I guess, because Dennis Dodd, our colleague, has got to call him up, and I'll, I'll rattle off a few names there. But um, uh, we do not come here to celebrate Mark Emmert. It's not an easy job. I'm not saying it's easy, but he really didn't handle this well at all. And the, the news coming earlier this week – certainly surprised me when I saw it because uh, this dude was given a raise and a contract extension a year ago coming off of the utter PR disaster that was the women's tournament. So I do think that there is a possibility we can get someone capable to hold this position, but we have to figure out what the position will entail. Like how much power will an NCAA president even have going forward if so much of what the NCAA is going to be is like running the championships, trying to have an improved enforcement model, but a lot of like the the stuff with name, image, and likeness and like actual legislation is going to be more on the schools and the conferences. It's 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 actually going to be a little bit of a tricky needle to thread. And I think that's why it, it becomes difficult to hire somebody who already has a great job because you don't know what the job is. I mean, it, it is impossible right now to describe what the job of the NCAA president will look like three years from now. I mean, you, you're, you're just guessing. So... Again, Mark Emmert made roughly $3 million a year. 
So, you know, somebody will take it. Uh, but it's a job without a description at this point. And I do think it's a difficult job. Now, there are other difficult jobs like, you know, scrubbing floors uh, sounds like a difficult job. But if somebody offered, you know, a normal person three million dollars a year to go scrub floors, they'd just be a floor scrubber. You know, they clock in at nine, clock out at five and scrub floors and make three million dollars. So they, they'll be able to hire somebody. But, you know, some of the names that have been thrown around like Greg Sankey. Like Greg sinky has got a better job than the job of the NCAA <laughs> president right now. He's more powerful. That's the he's whole more, point. Like, and right? he's more powerful. Right. Like if you've already got a good job for comparable pay, um, I don't think you're messing around uh, with with this job. Because the first thing you've got to figure out and anybody's got to figure out is what what does the job entail? What, what, what can I do? And, um, you know, I don't know if you saw the, <laughs> the interview with Brad Underwood, the Illinois coach. I did. I texted Brad last night. I actually yeah. appreciated what Brad said. Go ahead. But I actually, because what he said is what a lot of coaches are saying privately. He actually said it publicly. And I actually thought he presented it uh, in a realistic, rational way. Uh, some people listening don't have any idea what we're talking about. Go ahead. He, you know, somebody asked him about, it, it seemed to be a situation where he was meeting with local media, maybe. Yeah. And um, they asked him about, you know, the changes in, you know, in the challenges of, of the sport, and, you know, and he, he said, it's miserable. <laughs> he said, it's not any fun. And then he, he made a point to say, listen, I'm not complaining. I understand like this is just the way it is. And it, but there are no rules and none of us signed up for this. None of us, when we took our jobs to be college basketball coaches, uh, you know, did so under outside of guys who were just hired did so, uh, you know, with an idea that building a college basketball team or program in any sort of conventional way is like over with, like you can't do that anymore. He, he said, you know, back in the old days, which was really like four years ago, you would, you know, recruit some high school players, you'd get them on campus, you'd work them out and develop them. And, you know, you'd build them over years and, you know, you'd, you'd have a good idea by now who's going to be on your team next season and who's not. And right now you have no idea. I mean, outside of like Hubert Davis, how many people have a great idea about who's going to be on their team and who's not going to be on their team? And, you know, you know, Brad went on to say, you know, we had two big changes basically happen at the same time. And that's the one time transfer waiver and name, image and likeness. And that has turned the sport upside down. And you know, it, it is, I don't think it'll be like this forever with basically no rules right. whatsoever. Like there is going to be some structure that comes along and the next NCAA president in some way, I'm assuming is going to play a role in forming that. But what, what will he or she be allowed to do? What's legal? What isn't? I mean, the Supreme Court has already made it pretty clear. Try to restrain what student athletes can make, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll see you again, and we'll smack you we'll smack mm -hmm. you around again. So there's just there's a lot more questions about what is the role and power of an NCAA president right now than there are answers, and I just think that that, that makes finding the it, a it made Mark Emmert's job incredibly hard. Although they could have been proactive on a lot of this stuff exactly. and, and chose not to be. Yes. So that's on him and the people around him. Um, but it will also make his replacements job very, very difficult. At least Mark Emmert, when he took that job, uh, conceptually knew what he was walking into. The person who takes this job really has no idea what they're walking into. Which is why if the NCAA wants to set itself up for any kind of success, it needs to not bring in Mark. If, if it means that Mark Emmert literally is holding that position until he is leaving when he said he would at the end of June of next year, if that's what it takes, don't have someone come in and not fully understand what the job will be. I mean, this seems obvious, but it's the NCAA, so I feel like I have to say it. And yeah, we are at a time where NIL and the transfer portal hit in the same period where if you had a president that was better than Emmer and was forward thinking and you would have had the idea of this transfer portal and allowing players to uh, have a first time transfer with no sit out. If that had been introduced in 2012 
and then NIL had been introduced in like 2016, even then just spacing them out would have put men's college basketball and college sports on in general. I mean, this affects football and women's basketball and all that in a, in a better position to be a lit, a little more stable because the one thing that I'm hearing a lot and have heard a lot in the past two, three weeks from a few ADs, conference commissioners, and obviously coaches is where college basketball is right now. This, this cannot be sustainable. Like there, as you've said, GP, there has to be, some sort of uh, tweaking to the model that we have right now because it's absolutely wild what we are actually seeing. Um, you know, you talked about the Nigel Pack deal. And by uh, by the way, go get it, Nigel Pack. I'm not saying don't, but um, I mean, do you realize he's he is now the second highest paid person in the Miami basketball program? <laughs> it's, it's Jim Larry I, uh, Nigel Pack is making more. I guarantee you no Miami assistant is making $400,000. So I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's the, it's the state of the matter. Nigel Pack is getting paid to play at Miami next season, and he is the second highest paid person in that program. That's wild. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not even saying I disagree with it. But that reality has a lot of people behind the scenes just saying, listen, the players should get what they, you know, they should have this ability. But at the same time, like, it is just craziness behind there. I even, how about this? I was talking with someone two days ago, not in college basketball, not in college sports. They are a parent to someone who is a power level conference football recruit. They are being recruited by at least two schools that would be considered annually in the top 15, if you will. And this person who is not familiar, I just happen to know them through other avenues. They're not connected to college sports whatsoever. They don't, they don't know anything about it other than that, you know, they have a child who's good enough to eventually earn a scholarship to play at like the high level in college football. Even this person said, because they're, I guess their child's about to be a senior. So, but they've been recruited since they were a freshman. And they said in the past, like six to 10 months, things have gotten weird and creepy. Like people showing up, uh, like, you know, my, my son also can, does track and like they're showing up and there are people looking to get money and trying to like, there's like a weird element and vibe to this that was not there a year and a half ago. And as a family, we just don't like it. So just to, again, remove the college basketball element of it, just understand that within this push to improve player empowerment, there have been, these aren't even unintended consequences. Everyone saw this coming. I said it would be messier than it is now. Uh, and it is getting to that point. There are things that need to change where you can still allow for player empowerment, but not have so much instability behind the scenes. With all that being said, Parrish, the next NCAA president needs to understand and embrace the natural evolution of what college sports is. That is the biggest factor in all of this. Whatever he or she uh, has done in the past if they've worked in college sport or if they haven't. I don't even know if you need to go to, even Dennis Dodd said, don't go to the presidential model. Like, look at the past three, four dudes who have done this. They were all university presidents, and look where it led the NCAA. It's a great point by Dodd. Just have someone who, if anything, can bring fresh eyes to uh, the picture, and maybe, maybe you can set yourself up for some kind of success. I want to get to the candidates dot as well, but I don't want to keep it. So the, the, thoughts on all that. Well, the evolution has to be some sort of acknowledgement that this is pro sports, you know, it, 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 and, and, right. and, and must be treated as such, or at least semi pro. And that's just the nature of it. If players are going to get paid, there is a professional element to that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you've got to, um, if you want to figure out how, you know, a trial attorney in South Florida uh, can't just buy Nigel Pack, which is more or less what happened. He's also, by the way, just so we're clear on that, the person doing that, John Ruiz, he's a billionaire. So this is the exact oh, yeah. thing where people were screaming about this could happen. Yes, it is outright happening, but it's completely legal. Oh, yeah. I, I, I looked it up the other day. He like owns, I, I want to say, 70 percent of a company valued at more than 30 billion dollars. So, I mean, like multi-billionaire, it, right. it appears. And um, he, he clearly cares about Miami athletics and he's got money to throw around and he's making things happen. And you say everybody saw this coming and I, I think you're right. You and I have been discussing this exact possibility 
for years, literally years. But the one guy who tried to suggest it wouldn't be like this is Mark Emmert, or at least one of the guys who tried to suggest it wouldn't be like this is Mark Emmert. There were some other in the media who were like, but most of these players aren't worth anything. Okay. Nigel Pack just got an $800,000 deal. All right? <laughs> and a car. And a car. <laughs> Imagine if you were somebody who spent spent part of the past few years saying, I just, oh, I mean, a hand, only, this will only matter for a handful of people. Nigel Pack, a person most people listening to this right now never heard of before last week. We did not. And this is, listen, good player. But as I was telling a coach, I think yesterday, if not Tuesday, we did not talk. His name did not come up once on this podcast. Ever Lots until 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 Monday. His name had never been Correct. mentioned not, on this, this podcast. Nurse, that's not to say he doesn't deserve it. I'm just just if he's commanding that. Now it's that, also the billionaire that, wants to like, but just you know, keep that in mind. No, but that, that's my point. It's not to try to uh, be dismissive of Nigel Pack. It's to say that's what the Nigel Packs of the world are worth. A at least to the University of Miami. And now everybody knows. Miami's throwing around real money. Like, if you're a five-star prospect right now, why would you not be considering the University of Miami? At, at the very least, put them on your list. Let's see what John Ruiz has <laughs> got so for the, you. The Cavender twins, who are yeah. you know, social media superstars at Fresno State, where'd they transfer to? <laughs> Miami. That's right. where they're going. So, yeah. Oh, if I, had, if I had a kid right now who was 16 years old, I'd be like, and, and a, and a five-star prospect, I'd be like, all right, buddy, where, 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 what interests you? And he'd say, uh, Duke, North Carolina. Um, UCLA because of the goat McCronin. Um, and I think I'm, I think I'm down to those three. I'm saying, okay, cool. We're going to release our top four and it's going to be North Carolina, Duke, UCLA, and Miami. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And let's just see what happens. Let's just see what John, if nothing else, maybe John Ruiz will raise the price for John Shire or Hubert Davis or McCronin, but we got to have John Ruiz in the building. We got, if, if we are negotiating a name, image, and likeness deal, we got to have John Ruiz at the table. Because he could take the price up for everybody. So that's where we're at. And that's where we were always going to be. But Mark Emmert literally said, uh, you know, we've got to figure out a way to have name, image, and likeness rights for student athletes, but not allow it to become a recruiting tool. And I can remember being on one of these press conferences with these bozos. And I, uh, I you know, it was like, uh, press nine if you want to answer a question. I was like, nah, I got a question for these guys. And I'm like, um, hey, it's GP. Um, I hear you uh, saying that you want to uh, have a system where name, image, and likeness rights are allowed, but it's not a recruiting tool. How? How are you going? How are you going to do that? And they're like, "Well, you know, that's part of what we're working through right now." I said, "Okay," but I've been thinking about it. I didn't say this, but I was like, "I've been thinking about it for a while, and I can't think of it. How you do it? It like you know." I've asked people I think are smart who understand the world of college athletics. How does name, image, and likeness rights become allowed but not a recruiting tool? Just let's brainstorm for a minute. Let's all sit down and see if we can imagine how that works. Nobody could come up with anything. But Mark Emmert tried to suggest it was. And in some ways, and that leads to him you know, being caught. Like there's so many press conference moments over the years where it's like, Mark Emmert is an idiot. Mark Emmert is a stupid man. Like Mark Emmert is not an idiot and he's not a stupid man. I say this as someone who, you know, isn't a fan of his, but like, he's not a stupid man. He's not an idiot. The Kansas city Jayhawks thing was just a, he just slipped up. It, that's the type of thing that makes you sound dumb, but that's you're not. I mean, it came at the worst possible. It time. came at the worst possible time. The optics, I you. you will of all of this stuff. Uh, by the, the way. Like, he didn't yeah. even have, yeah. It, it, it was a slip up. It, that's the type of thing that makes somebody sound dumb, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are dumb. And that's what that was. I mean, listen, I laughed. I mean, at it made him look nervous as hell because he's up there with Kansas who still hasn't faced the consequences of the FBI scandal. I hear you. Come on, I, man. I hear you. Um, it was a bad look. And I laughed just like everybody else. But Mark Emmert is a man whose job it was for more than a decade to defend the indefensible publicly. And when that's your job, you're going to spend a lot of time looking stupid. Um, it reminds me of Bill Hancock, just a, a beautiful man who's the executive director of the college football playoff. 
Not the uh, guy who signed the Constitution, just so we're clear. You don't That's know that. John. That's John. Oh, yeah, John Hink. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two different people. So, Bill Hancock was the executive director or the face of the BCS before he was the face of this. And I can remember, he'd constantly be on radio shows or television and constantly being asked about a playoff before we had a playoff. He was like, can't have a playoff. Just can't have it. You know, because it ruined the regular season and it'd do this and it'd do that. And every time you'd listen to him talk, you'd be like, he can't possibly believe that because only a stupid man would believe that. And he's not a stupid man. But his job was literally to defend the status quo. So that's what you had to do. And when you got a job that makes you defend the indefensible, you end up looking dumb. So then guess what happens? We go to a 14 playoff. And you know whose job it is to now defend the 14 playoff? Literally the same man whose job it was to tell you for years you can't have a 14 playoff because it was a disaster. Same guy, new job, but same type of job. Defend the status quo. Defend the indefensible. Because now we're trying to go to an 8 team or a, thir- uh, a 14 team or a 16 team or whatever we're headed for. And it, now it's Bill Hancock's job to tell you, you can't do that. And here's why. Because it's his job to defend the, where we're at right now. And when we, get, when we inevitably expand the college football playoff, it'll be his job to defend that one against whatever new proposal somebody has. He's just doing an impossible job for a lot of money. And that is, on some level, what, what Mark Emmert um, and, and really any NCAA president trying to hold on to the status quo would have been doing for the past decade. Defending the indefensible, trying to hang on to the status quo, and when you got to do all that publicly, you end up sounding really dumb. I remember right after Mark uh, took this job, a handful of us, you know, people who have jobs like the job I used to have, which was you know, just a columnist, full-time columnist, and that's all I did was write stories. And there's maybe six or eight of us got invited to Indianapolis. Hey, the new NCAA president would like to meet with you know, a, you know, six or eight of you. And if you'd, you know, be willing to come to Indy, Indianapolis, like, you know, we'd have an off the record dinner. So we went to St. Elmo. I can't remember who else was there, but it was like, you know, people like me and Pete Thamel and, uh, you know, Mike DeCourcy, maybe Dane O'Neill. I don't remember who was there, but there, it was, just, and I just remember being impressed. Like he seemed candid and smart and sharp and he had big ideas and I really do think he took the job probably with good intentions um, because I remember walking away from that dinner somewhat impressed and optimistic. But then I think you just get into that job and being idealistic in that job, at least up until now, has never been the way to do that job. The way to do that job is to keep your presidents happy, university presidents happy, and try to keep the status quo as best you can. And obviously that has all been blown up now. And so the new president's job will be vastly different than Mark's. Um, but again, to circle back, I, I don't have any idea what that's realistically going to look like right now. Yeah, a couple uh, closing thoughts for me on this. First of all, Mark Emmert had no business being NCAA president into the year 2022, arguably even into the year 2020. I mean, it is a fact. It is a fact that Mark Emmert cost the NCAA hundreds of millions of dollars because they didn't properly ensure the NCAA tournament. So when it got canceled in 2020, they took a bath on that. They got paid like 60 cents on the dollar approximately in their insurance policy, as opposed to insuring it at a higher rate. The TV contract, listen, we're getting a great deal right now at CBS and Turner for how much um, the rate is versus what it actually could be. Okay. So you lost out on that on your previous negotiation. Mark Emmert's a very prominent voice in that. And that contract's still going to go for another six, seven years here overall. 